Uh, welcome back to the Ground Floor Auditorium. Uh, last talk before lunch, if I've got my timings right. Uh, Daniel is an independent uh, Python contractor. Uh, he's been a software engineer and working with Python for nearly 20 years now. So uh, hopefully lots of insight to share with us. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about how decisions are made inside the kitchen. Hi, thank you. Um, this is working fine. Um, OK, uh, so welcome to my talk. Thank you to Pile and Demon to organizing this great event. I'm having a lot of fun, and it's really nice to have an event like this in London, which has been my home for almost uh, a bit more than three years now. Um, I'm Daniel. Um, that's what I said. Yeah, mostly working. Uh, I'm Daniel, um, and yes, I'll be talking a lot about how the internal processes of the Python community work. I'm not really in directly involved in, the, um, in those processes. I've been more of an observer and lurker in this community and other communities. I'm very interested by this, but I, there's a lot of uh, people more involved than me in this room, so that's great for my imposter syndrome, but I'll do my best to try to help you. So let's say we want to have some Python for lunch. Uh, this is a great timing slot for this talk, right before lunch, so I can make you all hungry. Um, the thing is, uh, the first thing I'm going to be clarifying is that uh, Python, unlike uh, some, of, some of the language communities, um, has a very uh, close uh, connection between the language specification, which is Python itself, and the default implementation, which is C Python. And actually, in Python, they both are developed and come out in releases together. So the processes are, are really interlinked. It's hard to talk about those separately, which may be surprising for people coming for other languages, and maybe surprising for people in the Python community to know that other languages do these things completely separately. Um, but we want to have, have some Python. So how do we get our Python? Well, our Python comes in releases. Uh, the most important part of the releases is this uh, number which identifies the flavor of Python we're getting. Um, it's uh, called the major and minor number. Uh, some releases are already stale. You shouldn't eat them. They, um, they gone, they've gone bad because they're too old. Uh, and there's still 2.7 uh, two around that you can still have, but it's going to die by the end of this year. So you should really go for the freshest you can get. These releases um, come out, uh, well, it does not fix timing, but in practice, during the last 10 years, we have a new release every roughly 18 months, between one or two years between each release and the next. Um, and they usually last for five years. Once a release is made, uh, uh, maintenance is done for three years, and then for a couple of extra years, security fixes and, and major problems are fixed, but no big changes uh, are done uh, during successive sub-releases of each release. Uh, for each of these, 3.3 .3 has 3.3.0, 0.1.2, those are called micro-releases. Uh, the current state is that um, the last version to come out was 3.7, and 3.8 is about to be launched in uh, a few months, so we are very happy about that. So we are just having this for lunch, and the thing is, well, who prepared all this? How, how all this was prepared in the kitchen? Well, the first person we need to know is uh, who brought this to us and the ass and put the play together, and that person is called the release manager, or you can name it in a different ways. But the release manager, which is uh, around here, was the person, uh, the release manager uh, can be a different person for each uh, minor version. The one for 3.8 and 3.9, the ones coming out, um, the one coming out and the future one is Lukas Langa. I'm most likely mispronouncing his name. He's probably a, a, around here uh, frowning. Um, <laughs> But he's the person who um, comes out with the final release. What, what does a release manager mean? The release manager does a lot of uh, operational and boring tasks like putting the, uh, Lucas 
talk about this this morning, putting the tarball together and uploading to the website and uploading the documentation PDFs. He has some help with, from people who are called the experts. There's a Windows expert, a Mac expert, a documentation expert who help through the process of getting everything bundled together when the time is decided to come up with the release. Um, this is also the person that makes the announcement to the mailing list and who keeps everything on schedule to say, okay, you have to come in this before this day, otherwise it, it won't go into the freeze and we will have, you will have to wait to the next version or whatever. So actually this person also has a, a significant part of the decision making process. Uh, the release manager decides what goes inside the release, not, not in the, the big sense, but mostly putting a red line, like uh, someone is trying to promote a feature and the release manager may say, okay, this is still too immature and we want to release by this day, so this will have to wait, or this can get in, this, this is mature and ready and you can do it. The release manager decides when the micro releases go out and it, can also, it also has a decision power when a bug is, is discovered during the release process to say, okay, this is a blocker, we'll actually de delay the release because we really have to fix this before moving forward. Um, so that's what Lukas is doing. And there's actually, I, I don't remember the names right now, uh, active release manager for past releases for um, 3.6, 3.5, etc. And 2.7 even, which is still active. So, um, oh, I didn't start my timer, so I don't know how I'm doing. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, the release manager has to do a lot of stuff. Um, there's a whole document called PEP 101. I will explain what these PEP documents are in, in a minute. But there's a document somewhere on the Python website that tells you all the stuff you have to do to be a, a release manager if you want to know more about the, the role. So um, the release manager uh, makes the final cut, but it's not necessarily the person implementing all the features because that's a lot of work. Um, the main people working together to do this are the core developers. The core developers are in each station of each end making the soup, the address, the mains, and, uh, and the grill. And they are preparing the main things and making sure that they all go properly into the dishes and, and you have a tasty dish to eat. So, um, what does a, what, what's a core developer? Um, the main definition of a core developer is somebody who can commit into the Python repo, the people that have actually commit privileges. And they have a lot of, um, well, responsibilities around that. They are the people who can say, when other people who are not core developers are proposing changes, they can accept or reject it, and they can, work on the bug report and say, this is not a bug, this is actually a bug, and prioritize that. Uh, to be a core developer, uh, you have to be invited by another core developer, and recently the process has changed and there's some kind of vote about that. I, I haven't actually seen that going on, so I, I don't know much of the details. I only read about it. Um, so I may be wrong. Um, but it's expected from uh, coming up uh, core developer that they are providing quality contributions and they have been reviewed by other core developers many times in the past and they know how everything works and they are now allowed to do the, everything by themselves because they've done it many times successfully. There are currently, uh, there's not a public visible list of core developers but if we count the last, uh, there, there was a vote last year, which I'll talk about later, where all core developers could vote, and they were about 100 eligible voters, so they are roughly 100 core developers right now. Um, so these people uh, are there. Uh, most of these people are actually uh, volunteers or do, doing their work during uh, one day of the week where they are paid to do so. Uh, but most of them are purely volunteers that who love Python and who are putting a lot of effort and, and a lot of hard work to make this happen. Uh, there's actually someone made a count of um, 
how many full-time people uh, is actually working in Python, uh, paid by, by their employers. If you count uh, full-time people and the little bits of part-time people together, and it's around 2% or so of, of the people are working paid to the Python, which means up around two developers if you add them all together. Uh, there's also a thing that uh, there's some rotation uh, around this. There's the concept of uh, inactive core developers, some, someone who has been a core developer in the past, but then uh, is not doing a very regular work or has disappeared from the earth or, or whatever. So they are flagged as inactive unless they say, hey, hey wait, I'm still here, I'm doing stuff. Uh, there's a process to remove all core developers. So the group is, the, the, the active core developers are normally really people that still doing stuff. So these are the people who commit every commit in your Python repo. Um, so these are the people who build most of the thing you use. But there's a lot, as an open source project, there's a lot of uh, individual contributors from all over the world that are not core developers that participate in, in this project, which are the kitchen assistants uh, or the general community that participates uh, in different ways. Um, it's not just writing code, but writing documentation, discussing and proposing ideas and new changes, and submitting and sometimes reviewing pull requests and issues. Uh, sometimes someone posts an issue on the issue tracker, which is uh, a way to help because you're telling, hey, there's a bug here. And, then, and another person who's not a core developer says, OK, I can reproduce this, or I cannot reproduce this. And, and this helps the core developer, which will take the final work in hands in the end. Uh, to decide if it is an actual bug or not. And sometimes a community member says, OK, here's a pull request. So now the core developers only has to review and accept and reject. And, and so these, assistant, these kitchen assistants are helping the process come through together. So this is the, the roughly most of the, the people involved. I'm missing a, a big part that will come up too. So let's discuss about how, how someone gets into the kitchen and participates into that. So you normally, will, you normally will start as a kitchen assistant, uh, assistant and um, the main tools you will need are these three things. The first thing is that uh, all main uh, interactions in, in the Python development communities are ruled by the PSF code of contact, conduct. Uh, this is not a long document. It's like three paragraphs, which roughly say, be nice to each other, please. Uh, there's the Python Developer's Guide, which is in instead a huge document. Uh, there's a lot of content there, uh, depending on what you want to do and how you do it. There's a lot of guidance. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting document to read about how a community uh, a software development community organizes itself. So it's, it's, there are a lot of insights here about uh, how this all works if you have more time than a 25-minute talk. And there's, of course, uh, the, the CPython repo, which is where all the actual development is done, and not just the code, the documentation is there, and, and there are some uh, repos close to this where you have the website or, or, and other places you could contribute to. So if you want to get inside, um, normally people start doing what's called minor changes. Minor changes are something like updating documentation or fixing an existing bug or reporting bug or small changes. I, I made this, uh, this tweak that improves performance or add, added this small function to a library module that is very similar to the other 100 functions that are there. Uh, but generally, these kind of minor changes shouldn't conflict with whatever exists. Otherwise, you're, you're talking about a major change. A major change uh, is something that doesn't happen so often in Python, but happens uh, several times per release. Uh, things that you can find there are stuff that uh, breaks compatibility. This is typically to provide much better functionality or fixing an important bug. Uh, things that provide new ways of doing existing stuff. If, if something can be done in Python, but you provide a much better way to do it, um, there, there's an important decision there. Should we add this new stuff and have uh, redundant ways to do this? OK, this, this is probably a major change you're talking about. Uh, if you're adding an entire new module or overhauling the internals of the interpreter, I don't know, changing the whole parser or the virtual machine 
or stuff how that works is always major change. New syntax, no matter how small, is always considered a major change. So if you are proposing or working on a major change, uh, even if you're a core developer, uh, this requires a lot of discussion be before getting accepted. And typically, this discussion is done over mailing lists, but also writing a document called a PEP, which is a Python enhancement proposal, which, is, which are documents that the Python community proposes that says, OK, I want to do this change. Let's discuss over this, and let's see the pros and cons, and what impact it will have, and, and how this will be implemented, and, and a lot of details. So the different channels where this happens is uh, there's, a, there's a Python dev list. All the core developers are there, but other people can enter those lists and see uh, how the kitchen is working inside. And in the Python dev list, you normally see uh, actual changes or uh, existing, uh, existing PEPs being discussed and uh, approved or rejected. Is uh, or people saying pros and cons of, of the peps are discussing there. The Python ideas list is a more uh, general list where people say, hey, it would be nice if this. Uh, proposals here are always more uh, rough and unprepared, and people go refining and, and, and improving the ideas here. Typically, if this, it's a good idea uh, and it doesn't get rejected all right, it ends up in a pep that is discussed half in Python ideas, but the discussion starts moving by the core devs to the Python developer list. And there are a lot of other informal channels. Uh, there's a forum and IRC channel and uh, meetings at, at Python events where the core developers meet that other people participate and, and discuss uh, future changes. But any new, new features should lead to uh, uh, the development of a uh, of a pep, and the number one pep explains how to write a pep, because peps also describe internal processes within the community. So let's say uh, you have a great idea, you wrote down, you discuss it on Python ideas and possibly on Python dev with writing a pep, and you have a pep. Who decides whether that pep goes into the language or not? And there's a new role we haven't discussed yet, which is uh, what's called the grand chef, the person who is not just in charge of the kitchen, but who decides what goes, uh, what goes in the menu. This person used to be Guido Van Rossum, the benevolent dictator for life. But actually, that changed last year. Uh, Guido retired and told everyone, OK, you core developers should decide a new way uh, of deciding um, approval or rejection of PEPs. And that resulted in the steering council. The Steering Council uh, is an organization currently formed by Barry Warsaw, uh, Brett Cannon, Carol Willing, Nick Oglan, and Gilman Rossum is still in the Steering Council, but just uh, as a, one of the five members. And these people take the final decision on PEPs. This is a very important role because uh, this uh, is not just approving or rejecting stuff. By deciding what to approve and reject, they decide what's Pythonic and how the language evolves and where it, does, where it goes to. So it has a lot of other roles connecting the core team and the software foundation. And there's a system of voting it each, each time a new release comes out. So there's a lot of details on how this works on another PEP document that the, Python, uh, the core development team is a team that essentially produces PEPs for everything. That's what they do. And there's a pep for describing how they, are, they organize themselves. So uh, it's hard to get through all of this. Uh, well, the core team has very high standards, so we get the best dishes, and that's, that's really important. So there are some parts of this which are really hard. There's also a lot of mechanisms of support. You have the developer guide is amazingly uh, huge and comprehensive and detailed. There are mentoring schemes where you can, where they can, a core developer can mentor you to uh, start contributing. And if you want to be a core developer in the future, there are specific mentoring programs to introduce you. A mentor is assigned to you to get you as a core developer. So there are a lot of ways to help you if you are really willing to, to put the work to, to contribute. Uh, 
something you have to be ready from the beginning, and, and I see this uh, a lot, is you have to be really ready to defend your idea from reactions, uh, which may seem negative, but they are actually trying to protect what Python is. So if your idea is good, you have to be willing to discuss and defend it about different comments that you'll normally hear. For example, hey, but that breaks backwards comp compatibility. That's a dangerous change. There's more discussion needed about this. Uh, to give you a couple of examples of things that can break backward compatibility and seem very simple, um, one of the core developers here yesterday, Pablo, mentioned, OK, let's show, let me show you how to add a right arrow operator to Python. OK, let's say someone says, OK, this is nice. Let's also add a left arrow operator in Python, which is almost the same, right? But this actually is, uh, if you add this syntax, you will have redundancies because this also means a is less than than minus 3. So there are tiny details that may seem very minor, but can have a huge impact on all existing Python code. So everything have, has to be considered very carefully. If you want to add a new keyword, uh, that's also something that will always require discussion, because some people may be using this keyword name as a variable name, or a method name, or whatever. So that may be a problem. Uh, they will tell you that if you're contributing um, libraries or features, perhaps that could be a library and live in the package index and not be part of language. Uh, this is change that only a few people will benefit with. Uh, this is something we can already solve, and the solution is good enough, even if yours is a little better, or you, they can tell you your solution is worse than the existing solution. Uh, so there are a lot of things that you will hear about, uh, and you have to be ready to answer to all of this if you're proposing a major change to the, to the Python language. But uh, it's something that, uh, even if it's hard, uh, a lot of people do it, and Python changes and evolves. And there are some, uh, let me show you some examples of cases that have gone uh, in the history. For example, matrix multiplication was proposed in the year 2000. Someone said, let's add an at operator. Matrix multiplication operator it was slightly different than, than the current one, and it was rejected. And roughly at the same time, uh, Another person say, OK, let's have uh, element-wise operators. They added six different operators, which were rejected around the same date. And everything went cold. But 14 years later, um, in a very different context where uh, data science and, and OK, um, data science and, and the data science community was much more important in Python, Having a matrix multiplication operator was was really huge. So if you're willing to wait 14 years, you can get uh, <laughs> some changes accepted. Opinions can change. Um, I'll skip another example because I'm a bit out of time. But my main point to drive is that you can do it as long as your idea is good and as long as you're willing to do the work. I'll be around if any of you has questions or want to discuss this. I'll be happy to do it. And you probably can ask the core developers which know more about this than me. Um, but I'm, thank you for listening to me. And Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, as uh, as you said, uh, we're out of time for questions uh, now, as we need to need to go to lunch. But I'm sure we'll stick around for uh, discussion afterwards if you want to.